Okay, uh, if everyone could please um, keep, keep eating, keep eating, but, but uh, please um, hold that thought until uh, after our uh, keynote speech. Um, thank you all. Uh, hope everyone had a chance to get some food and there's still probably a little bit more and, and more coffee there um, if you'd like to, to get a little bit more. But I'm now delighted to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, the man we've been waiting for uh, all day, um, the president of the Japan International Cooperation Agency, or JICA, about which we've heard a lot, uh, but Mr. Akihiko, Dr. Akihiko Tanaka, who is uh, the uh, president since he's been president for about two years. Uh, actually, we're delighted this is the second time he's been to CSIS. He, was, um, he honored us a few months after he joined uh, in April of 2012 by speaking here uh, that summer, and, uh, and it was a terrific event, and we're delighted that he's uh, honored us again by coming again. Uh, Dr. Tanaka um, was professor of international politics uh, and vice president of the University of Tokyo, uh, before uh, his current, he assumed his current role. Uh, that puts him in a proud tradition uh, of uh, JICA leaders. His predecessor, Sadako Ogata, was also uh, in the same field, apparently. I didn't know that uh, before she uh, became famous um, as uh, uh, head of JICA and then um, UNHCR, as we all know. And uh, so he um, has uh, continued this tradition with his uh, background and expertise in international politics. And, uh, and foreign policy. And uh, he also along the way got a PhD at MIT, as well as his undergraduate degree at uh, the University of Tokyo, so he must be a smart guy, uh, I'm, I'm figuring. Um, so we are uh, delighted, if, if we may, to welcome uh, uh, President Tanaka up to the podium to uh, give his, his um, thoughts uh, on Japan's ODA strategy and challenges. Thanks so much. Matt, uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, it is my great uh, privilege and honor to be here at CSIS. As uh, uh, Matt uh, told you, uh, it has been a year and a half uh, since I had the privilege of uh, delivering a talk here uh, entitled Prospects for U.S.-Japan Cooperation in Development. I talked about the necessity of U.S.-Japan uh, cooperation in various areas, including uh, China, Afghanistan, Myanmar, which I think the U.S. government still called Burma, um, Asia Pacific as a whole, and the post-MDG uh, agendas. Uh, these are all uh, important uh, items of cooperation uh, now, uh, too. Uh, Myanmar, for example, uh, may be extremely uh, relevant at CSIS, our common uh, uh, friend, uh, Derek Mitchell, uh, is a um, um, U.S. ambassador to Myanmar, uh, with whom I had a great conversation when I visited uh, the country uh, last summer for potential uh, areas of cooperation uh, between Japan and the United States. Um, but over the past uh, year and a half, uh, new things happened. Uh, the most important change uh, in Japan uh, was the return to power of the LDP with uh, Prime Minister uh, Shinzo Abe. With his Abenomics, uh, Japan seems back on course for uh, growing uh, again. In addition to uh, domestic economic policy, I believe Prime Minister Abe has uh, really reinvigorated Japan's foreign policy. Uh, he has visited, I, I just counted, uh, he has vis visited 30 countries since he came back to power in December 2012. Um, he visited all 10 uh, member states of ASEAN uh, in Southeast Asia, seven countries in the Middle East. Uh, he visited Turkey twice, uh, four countries in Africa, and he visited the United States twice, uh, Russia twice, the UK, Ireland, Poland, India, Mongolia, Argentina, and Switzerland. Uh, during the same period, 
I thought as, uh, as somebody in charge of uh, Japan's development since I should uh, uh, go as many countries as uh, the Prime Minister. Um, but uh, I visited only, only 26 uh, countries in, in the same period. The difference I attribute is not ob obviously my re reluctance to go abroad. I love going abroad. Uh, it is simply because uh, he has his airplane, uh, <laughs> the Japanese Air Force One, uh, while I have to rely on uh, commercial flights. Uh, in fact, uh, many of the concrete activities of Japan's foreign uh, policy involve Japan's official development assistance. I feel extremely grateful, therefore, uh, to CSIS and uh, to Matthew uh, Goodman uh, to have organized uh, this U.S.-Japan Development Summit commemorating uh, the 60th anniversary of Japan's ODA. The, since uh, the two panel discussion uh, this morning already covered uh, the history, basic concepts, guiding uh, principles, and future prospects of Japan, as development cooperation, as well as uh, the prospect of U.S.-Japan cooperation in development areas. I do not want to repeat many of the same things, but it seems that I may be able to add uh, to the discussion uh, by presenting to you some of the concrete and lasting achievements of uh, Japan's ODA. Um, as Mr. Nakazawa and Mr. Araki emphasized in their presentations, or over the past six years, Japan has stressed uh, the importance of self-help and ownership by the government and the people of partner countries in international cooperation. Japan has also uh, emphasized the critical role of human resource development. And in this respect, I would like to uh, cite uh, two striking examples from our cooperation in Latin America, one in Chile and the other in Brazil which epitomize uh, this approach. Um, Chile's example is, I think, uh, depicted in JICA's world. Uh, but uh, now, Chile is uh, one of the top salmon exporting countries in the world, uh, occupying 39% of total global salmon yield. Previously, however, Chile had never been a natural habitat for salmon. In fact, salmon didn't exist in the southern hemisphere uh, until 1970s. The exposure of Chilean aquaculture specialists to Japan's salmon research in Hokkaido in 1969 triggered an amazing change. The Japan-Chile Salmon Project was launched in the early 1970s and engaged in basic research on salmon pathology, seed production, and feeding up until the early 1990s. The project, uh, sponsored by JICA and cooperation with the two countries, resulted in the growth of scientific knowledge in Chile with many brilliant uh, Chilean uh, technicians and proved the feasibility of the salmon industry in Chile. Once the feasibility was proven, the rest has been more or less taken over by the private sector, resulting in the salmon industry miracle in Chile. Part of the reason that we can enjoy salmon onigiri, rice bowl, uh, in Japan, or salmon steak in the United States at an affordable uh, price, is because of these technical cooperation projects between uh, Chile and Japan. A second example. Uh, of country ownership uh, combined with Japanese support uh, is an ambitious agricultural development project in Brazil. Until 40 years ago, uh, the region called the Cerrado uh, had been a vast expanse of tropical savanna in Brazil's interior and thought unsuited to agriculture. Since 1979, JICA provided technical cooperation for research and development of new soybean uh, varieties and cultivation methods, and established a joint venture to administer the migration of small-scale farmers to the region, and supported them with investment finance. By the mid-1990s, the project had demonstrated the feasibility of grain production in the Cerrado region. Again, 
after the feasibility was proven, Brazilian farmers and international agribusiness took over. Last year, Brazil exceeded the United States in its soybean production. Well, this may not be uh, an entirely happy uh, uh, result for uh, soybean producers in this country. Uh, but to the world in need of a stable supply of soybean at a reasonable price, and to the Japanese, uh, depending very much on the supply of soybean for soy sauce, miso, and tofu, the growth of Brazil as a stable supplier of soybean is certainly a welcome change. In addition to the emphasis on ownership and human resources development, Japan's uh, development assistance has consistently been pro-growth. Many pioneers of Japan's official development assistance, such as Dr. Saburo Kita, all emphasize the importance of economic growth for poverty reduction. Um, this, I think, conviction is partly as a result of Japan's experiences uh, working with the World Bank in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, that included uh, financing of the Shinkansen, uh, Tomei Highway, uh, Kurobe Number 4 uh, Hydropower Station, which are all important high, uh, infrastructure uh, projects that uh, propped up the uh, rapid economic growth uh, that Japan subsequently uh, followed. It, it is very much gratifying. Uh, to have the opportunity to meet with uh, Matthew's father uh, this morning, who was one of the World Bank officials that helped Japan uh, in those uh, efforts. Japan learned a lot from these projects and has similarly promoted infrastructure development as part of our ODA. One typical uh, project in Southeast Asia uh, was the Eastern Seaboard Development Program in Thailand. The program included the construction of industrial estates for heavy chemical industries and for non-polluting export-oriented industry, in addition to the establishment of related infrastructures such as ports, roads, and water supply systems. Japan's support was provided uh, in terms of ODA loans worth 1.8 billion US dollars from 1982 to 1993, and other grants and other technical cooperation projects. During the past 25 years, the Eastern Seaboard has gone into a large industrial and export base with 14 industrial complexes, 1,300 factories, including more than 600 Japanese factories and 360,000 workers. The main port of the region, the Lem Chaban port, now exceeds Tokyo and Bangkok in terms of the number of containers uh, it handles. The GNI per capita of Thailand tripled during the period of this project. Here again, the involvement of the private sector led to faster growth and more poverty reduction. What the Eastern Seaboard Development Program achieved was the construction of the necessary infrastructure to bring in the private sector and to accelerate development. For this type of pro-growth development strategy, encouraging private sector direct investment is important. Uh, in this respect, Japan's ODA uh, has functioned as a catalyst for bringing foreign direct investments and hence contributing to economic development in many Asian countries. Uh, according to an academic paper uh, by uh, Hidemi Kimura and uh, Yasuyuki Todo uh, of the University of Tokyo, who are my colleagues, um, a statistically significant amount of Japanese OD, uh, FDI in six East Asian countries is attributable to the presence of Japanese official development assistance. So there is a statistical uh, tendency that uh, wherever we have ODAs, then there is an attraction of uh, FDI uh, to that. Uh, based on such experiences, we feel extremely gratified that the recent international discussion, as the last panel discussion indicates, appears to support our viewpoints. More and more international development organizations stress the importance of ownership, human resource development, 
growth focused on sustainable development and increasing role of the private sector. The success of our examples, however, uh, does not uh, allow us to be uh, complacent. We still need to address several development challenges that are becoming more and more relevant as we enter the 21st century. On the one hand, there are the challenges of fragile states, which are still having difficulty in achieving many of the MDGs. The circumstances of the weak, including women, in such fragile conditions are extremely vulnerable. Involvement of terrorist organizations and criminal networks in such settings make matters worse. Therefore, peace building, state building, ethnic reconciliation are critical in many post-conflict societies. On the other hand, we are witnessing an increasing number of countries that register high economic growth. Many are moving from the less developed category to the lower middle income category, and some are moving further up to the upper middle income category. Those, these countries with relatively high income standards also face serious challenges. As the recent turmoil in the Middle East shows us, the continuing unemployment and underemployment, particularly among the youth, breed social tensions and disrupt not just political and social development, but also economical sustainable development. Economists often call such challenges of the countries as uh, middle-income traps. But the challenges may also include social ills created by air pollution, serious urban problems including traffic accidents, inadequate measures to prepare for natural disasters, and a lack of social safety nets including adequate health care. As Mr. Araki mentioned, human security is the concept applicable both to fragile states and to middle-income countries. Securing freedom from want and freedom from fear, that's the essence of the concept of human security, should be the goal of the international community in its cooperation with fragile states. Political and diplomatic efforts to bring about peace are essential to start any meaningful activities of peace building. Humanitarian assistance is critical in alleviating the pressing danger to vulnerable populations. But we must also emphasize the importance of introducing assistance to reconstruct infrastructure and to help develop uh, human resources in post-conflict countries. If people are to have hope for the future of their country, roads, bridges, ports, water supply systems should be repaired to stimulate economic activities. Vocational training for technicians, such as plumbers and car mechanics, nurses and medical personnel, SME managers, and administrators of local governments, also become important to provide basic services and to improve their livelihoods. Human security as a concept to prepare for downside risks is also relevant in many middle-income and, in fact, even high-income countries. The concept of human security can direct our attention to often neglected aspects of social and economic development. When a country is pursuing its growth policy in earnest, it tends to postpone policies that may not have immediate impact on growth. But once a serious threat to human security strikes, the damage could overwhelm the benefits that growth has brought to the people. A natural disaster can have this type of effect. Unless it happens, we tend to forget how serious the damage could be. But the cost of recovery easily exceed the initial investment in mitigation measures. Diseases, both communicable and non-communicable, and traffic accidents could also easily threaten people's human security in countries where health coverage is not universal. The cost of medical treatment could overwhelm a household's living expenses unless a sufficient safety net is established. As Mr. Araki emphasized in his uh, presentation, the reason that Japan is now promoting both disaster risk 
reduction and universal health coverage is based on our understanding of uh, human security. In efforts to ensure human security in fragile conditions and rapidly developing conditions, the United States and Japan, I think, are close partners. It is in the interest of both countries to reduce fragility and to help partner countries provide security and basic services to their populations. We have been working closely in Afghanistan, Myanmar, Iraq, and Pakistan. JICA personnel are temporarily, temporarily out of South Sudan, but as security conditions improve, we would like to resume our operations there too. Also, we are uh, restarting our activities in Somalia and Mali. The peace and stability of the Asia-Pacific region is also in the interest of both Japan and the United States. Japan's efforts to continuously support Southeast Asian countries including our efforts to enhance human security in these countries, are in line with the common goals of the US and Japan uh, alliance. Another challenge, as th that was uh, 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 talked about a lot in the last panel, was the increasing uh, number of various stakeholders, the uh, business, uh, NGOs, non-profit organizations, universities, uh, and cities and municipalities. Um, recently, uh, I see uh, strong interest in Japanese cities and municipalities to participate in international cooperation activities. Um, our role um, is to uh, orchestrate um, the various stakeholders uh, to work closely uh, to uh, find out innovative approaches to tackle various issues uh, to cope with what we call human security uh, challenges, as well as uh, the uh, private sector involvement in uh, the pro-growth approach with infrastructure uh, uh, and human resources development. The 60-year history of Japan's ODA has been, uh, I think, a learning process. Uh, we receive a lot of comments, criticism. Criticism of Japan's ODA, both from inside Japan and from outside, are all useful. Criticism of Japan's basic philosophy and approaches have also been uh, useful because they caution us not to become too complacent. Criticism against specifics are always our teachers to improve our projects. Dialogues with our critics have strengthened our capacity. We would like to continue such discussion uh, in the future. In addition to our emphasis on self-help and ownership, pro-growth strategy, and human resource development, we are now stressing, as I said, the importance of human security. The terminology is relatively new, uh, as the concept was coined by the UNDP uh, in its Human Development uh, Report in 1994. But the spirit, spirit of securing people's freedom from fear and want is not actually so new. Uh, let me quote one passage uh, from a document, a Japanese document dated in 1947. It said, I quote, we desire to occupy an honored place in an international society striving for the preservation of peace and the banishment of tyranny and slavery, oppression and intolerance for all time from the earth. We recognize that all peoples of the world have the right to live in peace free from fear and want. That was from the preamble of the Japanese constitution. We look forward to working with our international partners to get closer to realizing this vision, particularly with our American friends who actually helped Japan draft this constitution. <laughs> and it is this spirit that we will continue with our development assistance in the years ahead. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Tanaka-san has agreed to take a couple of questions. So again, I think there are microphones available. If you have a question, please raise your hand. We'll bring the microphone and again, identify yourself and ask a question. There's a gentleman up here in the front. I'll let you take them. 
Thank you. Thank you very much for that really very interesting speech. Um, Trevor Davis from KPMG. I suppose a question that, that I would be interested to know, quite a number of development agencies around the world, if you look at the example of Canada and Australia, have absorbed their development agency back into their Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, I'd be interested to hear from your, your view how the balance between the politics, trade, foreign affairs, and development priorities driven by a focus on outcomes. How, how do those coexist and how do you see that operating in Japan? Well, uh, JICA is an um, um, implementing agency uh, of um, official development assistance uh, that is uh, decided by the government of Japan. And um, um, so um, our role uh, is to uh, implement uh, as effectively and efficiently as possible uh, to the policy line that was uh, is decided by uh, the government. Um, the, um, uh, th 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 that uh, sounds rather passive, uh, but in fact, I think um, uh, our mission is to connect the uh, uh, needs uh, that we find in uh, uh, our partner countries in the developing world to uh, match uh, with uh, the, uh, the policy priorities of Japan. And um, there, I don't believe that we can artificially divide, this is development assistance, this is a, you know, a narrow foreign policy uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, uh, attempt, and this is a commercial attempt. I think uh, we cannot divide these things into uh, separate manners. I think what we would do uh, is to uh, um, try our best to maximize uh, all the uh, interests that uh, our stakeholders have. their lunch. Yeah. Other, other questions? All, all satisfied. Still, yes. still digesting. Okay. Uh, here, Dan. We're, I'm Dan Rundy. I'm with CSIS. Thank you very much, Mr. Tanaka, for being here. Could you talk about uh, Japan's thinking about the next round of the Millennium Development Goals? In particular, could you talk about how Japan thinks about the issue of governance? I, I know, for example, the UK government, you were part of a, of a committee that was Involved with the shaping of the, of the um, of, of, of a pro some proposed new goals, if I if I'm not mistaken, but I know, for example, the UK government is particularly focused on having a governance goal in the next round of MDGs. I'd be particularly interested. A, talk about how Japan's theme of the MDGs next round, if you will, and second, talk about what is Japan's view about a governance goal in the next round of MDGs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, the um uh, well, this is not going to be the official government position. Uh, as uh, the, um, uh, this is my personal uh, viewpoint. Um, I think the setting new goals uh, after uh, 2015 is quite important. And um, I think uh, in, in setting new goals, I think we need to uh, succeed the um, uh, elements of success that we did in MDGs. Uh, which is that well, I think one good thing about MDG was that uh, the goals were uh, uh, quite uh, straightforward and simple and, um, uh, and mostly measurable. Um, and so we, I personally believe it is uh, of the interest of the uh, development. And then also, I think, as uh, we discussed in the, the previous uh, panel discussion, what we need to do, uh, emphasize, is the results. Uh, the, not the uh, inputs or something, but the results. And so the tar new targets should uh, reflect uh, these uh, considerations. Um, but, um, and so these uh, sh should be uh, simple and easy to understand and uh, hopefully measurable um, and, um, um, and, and then showing the results. Um, the, um, I uh, believe governance is very important. Uh, the um, um, uh, factor uh, to uh, uh, in improve many of uh, the living conditions of uh, uh, the world. 
Um, the, um, uh, currently, I, I feel uh, a bit uneasy. Uh, can, can we find out a uh, uh, simple, very uh, easy to understand, measurable number that uh, can suggest the level of uh, or desirability of governance? governance. Um, if you can uh, find such number, I'm uh, all for it. But then, um, but then I think uh, the, 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 that can become rather complex. Uh, and then also, uh, as, as we, uh, you know, realistically speaking, we need to persuade uh, because the goal should be uh, um, uh, agreed by consensus. And so I think um, uh, I personally feel that go governance is a. Uh, uh, is, is, is the position of guiding principles. As, again, uh, the Japanese government is insisting that human security should be the guiding principle uh, of uh, setting the uh, uh, new goals. Um, but then again, human security, uh, uh, although I think it's critical, but uh, it cannot be reduced to single numbers. Um, the, um, I think the goals should be clear and measurable. But then uh, there are many uh, uh, measurable goals which we, we didn't have during the MDGs, as uh, Araki-san said. Um, uh, Disaster-related uh, goals are not there. Um, and so I think uh, uh, that uh, we, uh, uh, I, I think we, we still have one year or so uh, to go. And so uh, um, we would like to be as creative possible to, uh, in search of such uh, magic numbers that uh, motivate us to this strive. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Any other questions? Oh, there's one, one more in the back, and then we're going to have to wind up. We're a little bit, a little bit late. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you for a very uh, strong presentation, which I enjoyed listening to. My name is John Lamb. I work for Apt Associates. I'm retired from the World Bank, where I was agribusiness team leader. I'd like to uh, focus on your mention of neglected threats and raise one about which I wonder what JICA might be able to do in collaboration with the other donors. I'm talking about a threat that originally was thought to exist 15 degrees north and south of the equator globally, now is spreading to 30 to 35 degrees. It's affected by climate change, but I'm not talking about climate change. I'm talking about a naturally occurring organism in the ground. Uh, from the family of mycotoxins, mold, specifically aflatoxin. Aflatoxin is, a, is the most potent naturally occurring uh, carcinogen in the world, and it passes from the mother, if the mother's been eating contaminated food, usually maize or peanuts, but actually 42 different commodities, it passes from the mother directly through the placenta into the unborn child. When the mother starts doing exclusive breastfeeding, even if she's following the essential nutritional actions, she's passing another aflatoxin derivate into the, um, into the child. When the child goes off the breast and starts to have complementary foods, usually it's based on the same products that contaminated the mother to begin with. It's now believed to be associated with childhood stunting, with problems of gut health that impede nutritional uptake, and is associated with three of the communicable diseases. This is an unknown or unappreciated threat that requires global action. And I wonder how JICA might be able to contribute to the evolving campaign to deal with it. Well, um, the, um, uh, at this moment, I, um, well, J JICA is doing many, many things. Uh, uh, the, the president is, is actually, to, to tell the truth, is not uh, uh, really aware of all the, uh, uh, the projects. So I'm, um, the, um, at this moment, I'm uh, n n not aware of the project which is uh, uh, specifically targeting uh, to the toxin that you uh, mentioned. Um, the, uh, but then I think um, uh, the health is a very important um, uh, consideration of our activities. And um, um, 
and particularly maternal and uh, ch uh, ch child health, uh, we, we are uh, conducting uh, um, various projects all around the world. And so, uh, as, 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 as scientific evidence suggests, uh, uh, we, we would like to um, uh, direct our focus to uh, the uh, direction that uh, the, uh, the, the danger indicates. Okay, thank you very much. Tanaka-san, you have proven my theory of um, of public speaking, which is that uh, when you're invited to speak once, it's very flattering. And then you start thinking, you wonder if the, the organizers just invited you because they needed to fill a <laughs> slot on their schedule. Uh, but if you're invited twice, then it usually means that you, you must be good. Uh, <laughs> and indeed, you're, go you're good. So thank you. we thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and we'd like you back a third time, if you're, if you're willing. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. And uh, please come again. Take care.